And welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, this is the premier podcast for the website, cpluscomedy.com. Like I just said, it's a website. Go there. Okay, we're having a lot of issues today. Uh, For some reason, uh, everything is going haywire. Uh, (laughs) If you just bear with me, I really am trying to make all of this work. Oh my gosh, what in the world is going on? San Diego, Carmen. Uh, Here we are. Episode 170, I don't know, five, I guess. I, don't know, I lost count of uh, this show that has been going on for a couple years now. You thought I would skip another week after taking two weeks off? Well, you thought wrong, baby. You hear myself, turn myself up in the earphones. We're back. Let me just uh, go ahead and, oh, crap. <laughs> I, need to, I need to time this, too. <laughs> this is what happens when you, when you don't do things right the first time. Now you, now you know. Knowing's half the battle. Let's get on. We have a lot of stuff to get to. Uh, CBS All Access is uh, is about to become Paramount Plus. CBS All Access, as we know, was going to be renamed uh, and uh, rebranded as something that Paramount can actually use. Uh, now, here's the thing. I think CBS All Access was uh, was the perfect name. All Access to the CBS stuff to what CBS owns. CBS before re- recoupling with Viacom again. They, you, the network CBS owned were Showtime and Pop TV and and uh, and you know the other brands. I think that's the only other two. But now that they're a Viacom CBS, I mean CBS. I like, people know CBS. No one knows Viacom. So you would it, it would. I understand that people know Paramount more than they know um, CBS. But I mean, come on. Anyway, this comes from Variety, written by Cynthia Littleton. So it's going to become Paramount Plus, and it's it's more or less the same thing that it is, that it is now. Uh, just the branding is just going to be a little bit stronger. Uh, I don't know this all these all these plus names. You know, let Disney have Hulu Plus and Disney Plus. Uh, when Apple TV announced Apple TV Plus, I thought it would be better just for Apple TV, like just for it to be Apple TV. I you know it, insinuating that there's more with this plus thing. Uh, and that, and that's the only reason that I can I can name that they're doing that you know any company would name a streaming service you know brand name plus because it 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 says that there's more <laughs> to what they have to offer than the the normal I don't know but HBO Max is a better name like that's a that's a different name that's a different name when Hulu was Hulu Plus uh, when it was Hulu and Hulu Plus rather that's a different name. And, you know, Disney kind of cornered the market on the Plus branding. Hulu Plus, well, now it's just Hulu. Uh, Disney Plus and ESPN Plus. Uh, you know, Netflix, that's a memorable name. Hulu's a mem- Amazon, even Prime Video is a memorable name compared to, to Paramount Plus. No one's going to be running out for that. And I understand that the, both Showtime and CBS All Access are doing uh, well. They have CBS All Access is believed to have a subscriber base of about eight million, but uh, it it's crazy that they uh, they think it is okay. There's a reboot of the show The Game <laughs> uh, and a spinoff of Girlfriends that are going to be on the network appear on the streaming platform apparently. Hmm, interesting. Uh, well, The Game sucked after it moved to BET, so I can only assume that the survival is not going to be as good. As the uh, original three seasons. Uh, speaking of streaming services, Peacock now has 15 million subscribers. This comes from CNBC, written by Alex Sherman. NBC Universal's Peacock streaming service has 15 million signups. Comcast CEO Brian Roberts says, "Now this is no surprise. Uh, this and this is a this is a 50% increase in six weeks. Holy cow! Uh, NBC Universal has has a goal of reaching 30 million to 35 million active Peacock accounts by 2024." This is all this is very interesting because Peacock is free. And if you even if you have a, a passing glance at television, if you have a passing like of television, you should pick up Peacock. It's free. You should pick up any free service. Tubi, it's free. Crackle, free. Pluto TV, free. And yes, those come with commercials and uh, not the greatest shows, but they're you know, more often than not, they're going to have the shows and the movies that uh, that Netflix and Hulu and Amazon and HBO and the rest don't have. There's a, as I was watch, I was reading a uh, something on the New York Times last week, and they referenced 
the Richard Pryor uh, film, Hear No, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, and uh, it also it stars him and uh, uh, what's his name, Gene uh, here. Oh crap! My guess, See No Evil, See No Evil, Hear No Evil is nineteen eighty nine. Not a good movie. <laughs> it stars Gene Wilder, him and Gene Wilder, and it's their last movie together, I believe. Uh, and it did so poorly that it uh, they just didn't do any more together. Uh, however, very funny, you know, premise. It's it's a blind guy, Richard Pryor, and a deaf guy, Gene Wilder, and they become friends. <laughs> and and I can I imagine that's how it was pitched. Uh, just a, a guy hopped up on coke in 1988, going, uh, "How about Richard Pryor, Gene Wilder, a blind guy and a deaf guy become friends? Uh, how about that?" Uh, then what happens? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, they they find a, a a coin and it's worth a lot of money, and these two people are coming to kill him. This really hot woman who you get to see naked several times. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that works. <laughs> it's great. I I enjoyed the movie, uh, but it's on Crackle, and uh, I just looked it up on Google and. It was on Crackle and it was free, and yeah, I gotta watch commercials every you know couple of minutes, but who cares? It's uh, I, I didn't pay a cent for this very crappy movie from 1989, uh, but it's uh, you know it's a good time. So Peacock again has the uh, premium for five dollars and the and the uh, without that's with ads and then without ads for ten dollars. Uh, I, I I have free three months of uh, Peacock because I think they teamed up with Google and. And I got an email, and and they gave us a free code if you had like a, a Google Fi or a Google Phone or something like that. But I have both, so that's great. Uh, I, you know, Peacock's got some some decent shows and some decent movies, and uh, I'm just glad to see the show Code Monkeys surviving without G4. <laughs> Can't wait for G4 to come back. Now, speaking of which, NBC Universal was going to th- was threatening this past week, and this all happened within a, sp- a span of a day. The, to pull its TV apps from Roku amid a fight over Peacock deal terms. Written by Todd Spangler over at uh, The Variety. Uh, this, is, so this is Friday, or this is Thursday, I believe, when I was supposed to record this show. Roku and NBC Universal had an issue over uh, distribution of Peacock. And uh, this, this sounds familiar because Roku also has an ongoing issue with, or a, no, HBO Max has an ongoing issue with Roku at this point, at this time. Uh, these streaming services, they cost a lot of money, and but we know they're going to be huge. You know you know Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, they're going to make so much money. Uh, and when you are a distributor of apps, you want, you want some of that money. So you, I've mentioned this before, you, uh, you get paid to put those apps, to have those apps and distribute those apps. Uh, and then the streamers themselves, they get paid from us, from people who subscribe. Um, but it's it, now it's all about who gets the most share of that money. And so that's what they're fighting about. And Roku, the most popular streaming device in the world, you know, it goes Roku, then probably Apple TV. And then after that, it's like, you know, Chromecast, Android TV, <laughs> the rest. <laughs> so... Uh, this is very interesting. There's a story that had that happened uh, literally two hours ago, and I'm not going to talk about it until um, this next episode that is supposed to shoot on Thursday because, uh, uh, you know, because <laughs> I'm recording this very late. And uh, so Roku, uh, there, there's a there. The dispute went on for a little bit, and there's a, a back and forth. So NBC Universal was was going to remove, you know, the NBC app and Telemundo and all those other apps that they have that are, that they own. Uh, but then they reached a deal on Friday afternoon that uh, Peacock was going to land on Roku, and there's going to be a new renewed agreement. So there you go. That all of that happened uh, for them. So good, good, good for them to reach those type of deals. But Roku has positioned itself as the strongest streaming device company out there. I, I believe they have an IPO. I wouldn't, I would not doubt it if they, <laughs> uh, they, they do. Um, so Roku is in, is in a, is in the perfect place to demand more money. Uh, but these apps, you know, HBO is huge. HBO is gigantic. So, it only stands to reason that they do that. And then same thing for NBC, NBC Universal. They they know that Peacock is big. 
It's free and it's NBC. So people are going to download it anyway. Let's cover one more thing. EA is rebranding its subscription apps. This comes from Venture Beat. Games Beat, Venture Beat. Electronic Arts doubles down on EA Play brand with EA Desktop app written by Dean Takahashi. Electronic Arts is launching a new EA Desktop app, the beta version of its revamped Origin online gaming service that EA calls a next generation PC gaming platform. But it's more one more app among many in the subscription loving video game business today. EA EA uh, rebranded to EA Play, not, not EA, this, but EA's you know gaming service uh, was now rebranded to EA Play. You pay five dollars a month, you get access to old EA games. So last year's Madden, last year's FIFA, last year's NBA Live. I think if one came out, they were the year prior. Um, most of the recent Need for Speeds, you know, it's like a, it's like a just you know 20, 20 games, uh, which is not bad. Five dollars a month, uh, sixty dollars a year, something like that, or fifty dollars a year. Um, but now it was announced that uh, the uh, the subscription service on the Xbox is going to bleed into uh, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. So now there's one gaming subscription service on Xbox. Uh, and you get all the EA games. You get the early. You get it's everything that EA offer, EA Play offered. Uh, and but now they also <laughs> rebranded EA's uh, streaming gaming gaming uh, subscription service as EA Play on the Xbox for some reason. It's <sighs> it's annoying. Anyway, but that's a this is a good move for EA. I I think this is uh, this is something that's going to create. And the I guess the CEO said. Create less friction is what I just skimmed over. The new app promises a faster experience, fewer clicks to jump back into your favorite games and playtime controls. Uh, blah, blah, blah. You should find it easier to install games. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the uh, EA Senior Vice President, Michael Blank. What's his last name? That was a good joke. Said in an interview with GamesBeat, <laughs> the EA desktop is being designed to deliver a frictionless and socially connected experience that is faster for players to get into their games. So now they're all about usability. Uh, but this is just yet. And, and so on the, the PC version of this was called Origin uh, and Origin is going away, obviously. But this is just another way for people to have subscriptions. And, you know, game... And there's going to be crossplay apparently. Oh, interesting. Okay, it'll it'll do its best to do crossplay, cross progression, and cross generation play on every game if it can. Uh, I mean, Xbox Game Pass I, Ultimate, I believe, has 15 million subscribers. Uh, I, what I saw today, the 21st of uh, September. Do you remember? Demi a did you did you wave Demi a did you eBay's uh, 21st uh, September video came out today. I did not know. I even forgot. And I watched it. And it was such a great thing. And uh, you should watch those every single year. This year he's doing it to raise money for uh, four different organizations. It's great. Go donate. $50,000. Any hoosers. That's the goal if you don't know. So, uh, but 15 million subscribers for... For Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, um, there's going to be PlayStation, Sony announced for PS5, there's the PlayStation Collection where you get a collection of 20 games for a subscription price. We don't know how that's going to be, uh, if that's going to be baked in with PlayStation Plus or not. Um, and then also there's PlayStation Plus, Xbox Live Gold, uh, and Nintendo Switch Online. All of them are subscription services. All of them offer you free games. For Nintendo, uh, and to the very least, you don't get to own those. But... That's gonna. This is taking gaming into an area that's. It what look. It's a great deal for gamers, but it looks like it's a bad deal for developers. Um, if you don't own the game, like I mean, used games and buying and owning games are great because you know you can go back and play GTA Four and just run around and and uh, blow things up. Uh, you can go back and play, you know, Crash Bandicoot, and Mario and stuff. But owning, but subscribing to a service, playing a game, 
you know, for a certain amount of hours. Uh, testing it out is great, but then keeping a game and just keeping it on service, I don't know. It always, uh, it just seems like it's a bad deal for the developer uh, in the long run. But uh, they like it, people like it, and uh, and I like it, so it's great. Um, but yeah, we'll see how EA's uh, Gambit plays off. Listen, we'll take a little break. When we come back, we'll do the rest of this episode. Here we go. Going to the break now, baby. <laughs> One. And oh my God. <laughs> oh Jesus. Oh God. Keep it in. Keep it in. The microphone keeps tipping over. Uh, I do believe because it doesn't have anywhere to lean. And there we go. I saved it. Welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. Going to restart my clock right here. Here we go. Okay. Let's continue on with this story. Z that we have down here. DC Universe is going to rebrand. Oh, God. Sorry, I'm getting a little hot there. DC Universe is going to rebrand as comic subscription service. All shows are moving to HBO Max. Now, we knew this was going to happen. We knew this was going to happen. As soon as uh, they said Stargirl was going to air on. <laughs> no, no, no. As soon the thing, they, there are a lot of, a lot of factors went into this. One, HBO Max was announced. <laughs> As soon as it was announced last, you know, uh, summer, uh, I think it was fall, late, early fall, late summer. As soon as it was announced, I knew right then and there that everything from DC Universe, the app was going to move over to HBO Max. Um, and then when Stargirl, what, when they broke their exclusivity contract with uh, when DC uh, didn't re up with Netflix, uh, that was another telling sign. They're gonna they're gonna start putting their um, the CW shows that were on that were heading towards Netflix to on HBO Max, and then when Star Girl premiered and it was it premiered on DC Universe on Monday and then on Wednesday it aired on the CW. I that, like that was the nail in the coffin right there. Um, and then all, and then all, and then also uh, the new Harley Quinn show. I mean not the new Harley Quinn. The second season of Harley Quinn. The cartoon and uh, Doom Patrol. They both moved to HBO Max, <laughs> and no one knew about it until like they premiered. So, or like around the same time they premiered. So, we this is this is this is like a telling sign. We knew this was gonna happen. Uh, so Harley Quinn was renewed for season three. Doom Patrol is renewed as well, and uh, Star Girl is gonna become a CW original. Titans is going to head over to HBO Max at some point, hopefully soon, because I've only seen three episodes, uh, and I would love to finish off that show. Uh, and then at some point, uh, I can only imagine that every other thing, Young Justice, uh, I can only imagine that every other thing on there is going to move over. It's going to be great to have a, a place to watch the Justice League cartoon again, and uh, Batman Beyond, and the and, and Static Shock, and the other shows that I've only been able to watch since they left Netflix or whatever streaming service they were on uh, since the day they left. Um, who, because nobody wants to watch DC Universe. But now DC Universe is, so DC Universe is going to become DC Infinite, I believe. Universe Infinite. And it's just going to be, it's going to be a comic book subscription service. So I believe six months after a comic book has premiered in the print version, it'll head over there to digital. I think it's still, and it's still $8 a month. <clears throat> That's a good deal. My Marvel has Marvel unlimited and it, and it's a similar service where it's, you know, a couple bucks a month and you get to read a majority of Marvel comics. Uh, you know, but I really wish that, <laughs> that these companies would just admit what we know is going to happen. You know, eventually Nintendo is going to come out with a Nintendo Switch Pro or like a, a, a slightly upgraded version of the Switch. And, uh, but they're going to be like, oh no, it's the, the, the old Switch is fine and we're going to continue building for it, making game. Or, you know, I'll use it like this. When the Switch came out, the Nintendo 3DS was on its deathbed. And, the switch is Nintendo basically saying, Hey, we can do home home gaming and uh, on the go gaming. 
uh, and we can do it with one thing. And they tr- they tried, you know, for the past three years. Yeah, this is going to be great. We're gonna we're gonna put games out on the 3DS. We're gonna keep updating it. And then just last week, they said, "Oh, we're not producing the 3DS anymore. We're not making any games. No other games will come out." Why? Why do that? You know, <laughs> the people who are going to buy a 3DS are going to buy a 3DS. They want to play Pokemon Sun and Moon. They're going to do it. You know, they're they're the me's. They're going to buy. The, they're going to have it. You know, over there and everything. It just doesn't make sense to. Uh, and I get it. There's is it's a whole thing of money, but you know who cares. Next up, another GMA third hour revamp. This comes from Variety, written by Brian Steinberg. T.J. Holmes joins Amy Robach as co-anchor of ABC's GMA3. So earlier this year, uh, late last year, it was announced that the third hour of Good Morning America was going to be co-hosted by Michael Strahan and I don't know the woman's name. Sarah Hines. I knew it was Sarah something. Uh, It launched in 2018 for Michael and Sarah and it was a way for the, for, it was called GMA Day uh, and then Strahan and Sarah, and then Strahan, Sarah, and Kiki, because Kiki Palmer joined as well, and it never became the show it should have been. It was because the Today Show did the same thing with Megan Kelly's hour, which I've been thinking a lot about Megan Kelly um, lately because uh, she has a new project coming out, but also she escaped Fox and went to TV, uh, t- uh, went to NBC, and obviously didn't pan out NBC, but you know. <laughs> I don't know what the end goal of that was, uh, or nor, nor, uh, nor do I know the end goal of that sentence. But the third hour of GMA and Megyn Kelly's uh, Today Show were supposed to be these audience-driven. You know, they have audiences uh, inside of the of the um, of the the studio, and they're going to sit there and talk and everything. And then you know, the pandemic hit and uh, the GMA's third hour with Sarah Strahan and, uh, and Kiki, it became, they obviously couldn't do that show anymore and they didn't know when they were going to return to the uh, studio. And obviously something has to get the ax and it's going to be the superfluous hour in uh, good morning America. So now Having brought back, and I did a news time story about the third hour of Good Morning of Amer- Good Morning America. Don't know why I said that twice. Uh, they're going. ABC News is going to start doing a uh, more hard news focused version of GMA three, and then they're going to take that hour and air that on ABC News on its ABC News apps. I believe Amy's going to stay on. Yeah, Amy is staying on. Strahan is not, uh, which frees him up to go home. <laughs> but he's not. He's got football duties. I don't know why. This guy is the hardest working, one of the hardest working people in. It's him, Anderson Cooper, um, and uh, Ryan Seacrest. It used to be Chris Hardwick, too, but he's not <laughs> doing anything anymore. But I like I if if I was friends with uh, Michael Strahan – and Ryan Seacrest, I would truly be wondered, uh, truly be wondered, truly be worried about uh, about them. Uh, I just got a, I got a notification. I thought it was a text. No, it is from Indeed. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing what this third hour of GMA is going to be. Hopefully, it's something that is a little bit more sustainable. Uh, there, everyone's back in the studio now. Even Kimmel's going back to the studio. So. And so all and all the news anchors are in the studio. Uh, so this should be I don't want to say easy, but it should be easy for them to do. You just talk to the camera, do stories, and it doesn't have to be the uh, the pop stories of the morning that GMA already does. I've already said this before, and I'll say it again. CBS this morning is the best morning news show. Uh, it's the black coffee version, you know. It's for the people who don't want sugar, who don't want cream. They just get their coffee, pour it in the in the cup, and they drink it. And they love the bitter, you know, dark chocolate taste, uh, and they deal with it. Uh, versus, you know, the 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 I need three three shots of of uh, of cream and. And uh, just 18 teaspoons of sugar of uh, Today Show and GMA. So 
There you go. And lastly, but not leastly, <laughs> there it is. Lastly, but not leastly. <laughs> uh, this comes from Indie Wire, written by Eric Kahn, Alfonso Caron, on the disappointing Oscar inclusion rules and supporting a rising Indian filmmaker. So this is a little interview that they did. Uh, and I'm not going to go, I'm not going to bore you with the details, mostly because I have not written, written, written it, read it. But Kiran is a staunch winner of all of the uh, Oscars. And, but now he has mixed feelings about the new inclusion standards that the Academy has set. So I did a, did last week's episode. It was a, all about the uh, inclusion standards from the, uh, the new inclusion standards for best picture that the Academy has put out. Uh, if you want to know those, Google it. <laughs> or listen to last week's episode. Kiran has something to say. This is a quote. Everybody is trying to figure out ways of making more diverse cinema. The interesting thing is that it's not coming naturally. Everybody has to respond to outside pressures. That's a little bit disappointing that, that it needs to go through those rules and regulations for things to happen when it should just be a natural process of societal evolution that apparently is not happening. That's a, and that, that's a wonderful take on it and it should be it's 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 more in line with what i'm what i always think is uh you know we should be able to do this without we should be able to have a trans character in supergirl without it being a big news story on you know all the major outlets um or a trans actor not a trans character well a trans character too but a trans actor and a trans character uh who are the same person <laughs> on supergirl um you know, we should be able to have women directors, people with disabilities, people of color, all that stuff without without it being a big deal. However, we are in a point uh, that it needs to be forced. Uh, and, you know, it's if it can't if it's not going to be genuine, it's been it's been what, 70 years, 90 seconds. So, uh, wait, no, the Emmys are 92 it's been a hundred years. It's been a hundred years. Let's just say that, you know, for these movies and televisions and uh, all the, you know, for these things to exist and the Grammys and the Tonys and all this stuff. And yet it takes a musical, a rap musical about Hamilton for people, for white people to see that there are people of color who can act in the same roles as white people. We should like, it shouldn't, a Black Panther, you know, as much as I uh, dislike superhero movies, Black Panther, it shouldn't take Black Panther to have uh, until Black Panther to have a uh, an actor of color who plays as a major superhero. We sh- like it shouldn't take all of that. And I don't care if you're following a template for the comic book or not, or for the book for that matter. It shouldn't like you shouldn't care. It shouldn't be a thing that Star Wars that John Boyega now hates not hates but now has a disdain for Star Wars and Disney because Disney doesn't know how to write black characters I mean it's or, or characters of color because he's he was standing up for the rest of the, the the people in the movies too so I mean it's just insane and and if you and if you don't get it then you're not you're not along for the ride now Quran also has a more specific way of support filmmaking from uh, backgrounds other than his own He's executive producing an Indian director, uh, Chaitanya Tamnani. Uh, that movie, the movie's name is uh, The Disciple, and that was the director whose name I butchered. Uh, and But not everybody's doing that. You know, Quran is a person of color himself, so he's able to do that, but or he's willing to do that, you know, but it's not... And, you know, God forbid, I love Quentin Tarantino, but Quentin Tarantino, Scorsese, uh, Greta Gerwig, these these are people that are not going to automatically support people of color. And uh, it's a shame that they're not going to. But, you know, Quran is in a position where he can do that and he can tell his peers to do the same thing. Michael B. Jordan is the only one doing that. Um, Ava DuVernay is the only one doing that. But everybody else is just kind of in their own bubbles. Uh, and it sucks. Um so there you go. Listen, that's it for today because I got still have to, oh my God, the trash valet people are just out there rolling the carts around. Um, 
And so that's it. I got all I have for today. Listen, if you like what you heard here, head to the website, cpluscomedy.com, where you can see interviews with your favorite people, your favorite comedians, uh, as well as some stuff that's coming up that I worked on. I'll talk about, I can't talk about it. Dang, dang it. I'll talk about next week and next week's episode. Not the, not the episodes coming out this week, but week after next, I'll mention it. Uh, or, you know, maybe I'll mention it this week. Who cares? And, um, if you want to see a video version of this show, head to youtube.com slash people's comedy. You can see me sitting here in my jammers. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, also on youtube.com slash people's comedy is the uh, premiere show news time, which is a weekly news show where I take one story and I dissect it down to its little bits. This week's episode was about, uh, ooh, I sure as crap do not know. I did a parody of uh, Bill Maher's new rules. So that was pretty fun. This episode is about the Academy's rules. <laughs> God dang it. The thing I just talked about, the Academy's new rules and all that stuff um, for diversity in the big picture and all that stuff. Yeah. All right. Anyway, thank you for listening. Oh, listen to the Constitutionals podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Tell your friends about it. Subscribe on wherever you get it. Rate and review on Apple iTunes, on Apple Podcasts. All right, we're going. Goodbye. <laughs>